All right, good morning. Um, we will begin with a word of prayer. Jeffina, uh, could you pray for us? Uh, if you can open with prayer, we'll get started. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day, for the past that we have given us. For right now, I just pray that uh, you will lead us and guide us as we are reading the scripture. And God, as we are focusing on your word, but I just pray that you will help us open our mind and heart and listen to it and accept it in our heart. We will be convinced in your truth so that we can walk in your ways, Jesus, so that we can walk in the way of the righteous man, as you said. Be with us, guide us, let your Holy Spirit lead us. We pray for good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. And God, I pray for all the classmates who are yet to join, uh, that you will help them to join as soon as possible. And Lord, this class will be a blessing to all of us. We give the commandment to your hands be blessed. Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you. All right, we'll uh, begin. Uh, so, uh, last week uh, we looked at John chapter 10 and 11. Uh, we looked at Jesus the shepherd, uh, the true shepherd. And we also looked at the story of Lazarus and how he was raised from the dead and the impact that it had. Um, people were so um, uh, amazed at the miracle that many of them now began to truly believe in Jesus as the promised Messiah. So we looked at those details. So um, even as we begin John chapter 12, uh, we see a continuation of this uh, in the sense uh, everyone has now heard about the amazing resurrection of Lazarus. And uh, uh, so now everyone wants to see Jesus. Uh, they want to hear him speaking. And uh, so here, right in the beginning of chapter 12, uh, we have a dinner that has been arranged specifically in Jesus' honor. Um, uh, and we see in these first few verses that uh, somebody named Okay, here the, the person who has um, hosted the dinner is not mentioned, uh, but then we see him mentioned in the other Gospels. So let's actually begin uh, by reading uh, some of the verses. Maybe we could read out the first six verses. That would help. Uh, so if we could have someone read out for us, John chapter 12, verses 1 to 6, please. John 12, uh, 1 to 6. John, uh, John chapter 12, verse 1 to 6. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany when, where Lazar, uh, Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. They, there they met him at supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of uh, spike and nerd, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with, with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Excarot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this pregnant all not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Yes, thank you. Thanks for reading out. Um, so we see here that uh, dinner has been uh, hosted in honor of Jesus. And we have uh, Martha, Mary and Lazarus present. It is not taking place in their home. Uh, because in Matthew chapter 26 and uh, Mark chapter 14, we learn that the host is actually Simon the leper. Uh, so he's the host, 
uh, he seems to have some kind of skin disease so he's called simon the leper however he is wealthy enough rich enough that he is recognized in society in spite of his uh, skin disease uh, so uh, you know leprosy was just a common term that was used uh, it did not mean you know that leprosy which was infectious and which would uh, spread it could just mean any skin disease all right so uh, this man probably had some kind of a skin disease and he was wealthy and he is hosting a dinner here in honor of jesus and uh, uh, the uh, many of the guests who have come over here they have come over here to see lazarus who has been raised from the dead and uh, so on this occasion when everyone is gathered in public uh, you know mary comes forward uh, to worship jesus in her own way uh, so uh, she has brought with her a pint of pure spikenard is what it says that's a uh, a very expensive spice uh, a perfume made with that expensive spice and she takes it and she pours out the entire um, you know uh, bottle on to the feet of jesus and begins to wipe his feet with her hair i mean not just with a cloth or a towel but actually with her hair and it says here the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume um now uh, it was customary uh, that if you went to the dinner of a wealthy person he would have servants available who would honor the guests by you know washing their feet and in some cases they would in fact um, you know use some, use some uh, perfumed ointments uh, which they would you know dab on the forehead or on the head or, or on the hair of the uh, guests uh, this is just to honor them Uh, so on this occasion um, it's not um, uh, water which is being used for the feet but here we see uh, mary actually using a very expensive perfume uh, to wipe jesus feet and uh, uh, it, it says the perfume fills uh, the end the fragrance of the perfume fills the entire house uh, and jesus you know goes on to say in the in in the next few verses that this uh, is is kind of uh, anticipating the sacrifice that he is going to be making and so this is uh, in honor of his death and his burial uh, now of course mary was not aware of this uh, but even as the even as god kind of stirred her heart to make this sacrifice she becomes willing to do that she did not know why she is feeling this urge in her heart to make this sacrifice but when when that um, divine urge comes into her heart she responds and in fact i'm sure that she didn't didn't take this um, you know um, decision on her own because this is a very expensive perfume we get to know uh, a little later in one of the following verses that uh, to just purchase this one small you know bottle of perfume uh you would need an entire years wages so which means uh you know if a person has worked an entire year and earned a salary all of that every penny of it would go into just buying this perfume so um this was probably some kind of an investment which these uh, you know uh, this family of three has made uh, in those days they didn't really invest in gold Uh, and you know platinum the way they invest now uh, uh, these are all uh, portable items easy to store uh, and so uh, people you know invest in these things in our current day uh, people like to you know invest in gold they're not going to wear all the gold which they have bought on you know on themselves that would be rather awkward but the, the reason they keep investing in this gold is that when they wish to buy a large piece of land or they want to invest in something uh, in some business venture or there is a time of need and scarcity at such times this gold becomes something um, you know that's readily available in their hands uh, to sell and use the proceeds for whatever purpose they have so in the same way in those days it was not gold that people invested in um uh, because gold was a precious metal that was hard to come by um rather 
people invested in things like this you know spices uh, uh, perfumes uh, these were all expensive things so it looks like mary martha and lazarus uh, have invested in this you know kept it with them for a rainy day and so some day if the need arises you know they would be able to sell this and with the money they would be able to uh, you know uh, invest in whatever they have in mind now this family has decided that they would like to honor their uh, honor the lord by giving their most precious investment pouring it out upon him on his feet uh, and uh, uh, so when judas sees this amazing you know act of worship uh, he is not at all moved he only thinks about the amount of money that has gone on somebody's feet so he thinks oh my what a waste you know so uh, in that sense he speaks up and he says why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor and the explanation that is given is that he didn't really care about the poor if it had been given to you know the way they you know if it had been sold and given um, if the money for it had been given to them then he could have helped himself to some of the proceeds because that's usually what he did it's like it explains over here that he was a thief and he sometimes used to take money out of the uh, money bag which had been entrusted to him so with that intention um, uh, he says that uh, but look at the contrast which is drawn over here uh, between mary martha and lazarus on the one side and judas on the other side for them pouring out this expensive investment upon the feet of jesus was not waste it was worship on the other hand looking at it from judas perspective all he thinks about is the amount of money that could have been obtained from that and so he he sees it as a huge waste and he thinks oh if only that could have been converted into money and given to them at least he could have helped himself to some of it so what looks to one person as a worthy investment can look like a complete and total waste to another it all depends on our perspective so someone with a kingdom perspective would value doing something for the lord they would regard it a privilege to even suffer beatings for the lord that also is considered an honor you know because we see later in um, the book of acts uh, whenever the disciples were persecuted or they had to undergo some hardship they were it brought them joy to know that they are doing this for their savior for their master so what can appear to in the eyes of the world as a waste as uh, something that is so unnecessary can seem very valuable in the eyes of someone who has a kingdom perspective and so how do we look at the things of life you know that can really be like a test a litmus test for us um, do we look at kingdom things the way the world looks at them and think of them as something that just, just to be done on the side something that you do in your spare time or do we see it as something uh, as a driving passion that you know uh, drives us to do things make sacrifices to go the extra mile just so that we can honor the lord because even the people in the secular world uh, they to um, practice religious uh, activities but many of them just do it as something on the side you know something that you just do in your spare time but then for the true believer for the person who is a true follower of jesus for them uh, jesus becomes the topmost highest priority he becomes the passion and so nothing done for him is is a waste um how much ever is invested you know uh, how much ever is poured out upon him it is something valuable not at all considered a waste so uh, the question that we can uh, uh, ask ourselves is in my heart and mind in my deepest heart and mind do i think the way judas thinks do i see anything that's done for the kingdom as oh a waste of time or something that's taking up all my effort or something that i have to do because it's my duty and obligation to do it do we see kingdom matters in from this perspective or do we see it the way mary saw it 
uh, and you know the the way uh, Lazarus and Martha saw it, even as they were supporting her in this act, um, did they see it as the most wonderful, precious thing that you could possibly do for your Lord and Savior? How were they seeing it? Uh, you know, uh, and how do we see it? Uh, so that can help us to assess, you know, how uh, how valuable the Lord is to us. If a sacrifice feels too painful and uh, unnecessary, then maybe we still do not love him enough. On the other hand, if no sacrifice is really uh, you know, too much for him, then it shows that uh, we are beginning to love him the way he should be loved and appreciated. Okay, so that just kind of helps us uh, to ask ourselves from time to time, do I have the attitude of this uh, of these two sisters and the brother, or do I have the attitude of Judas? Um, just another one thing that we could maybe touch upon, even as you know, before we move on to the next uh, passage. Um, there's a lot of confusion regarding this particular event and another event which is mentioned in Luke chapter seven, uh, verses thirty-six to fifty. Now you see in Luke seven thirty-six to fifty. Um, there it talks about a woman who brings an alabaster jar of perfume and uh, she pours it out upon Jesus. And it says over there that she was a prostitute. Now, uh, that event is different and it's not to be mixed up with this event which happened, you know, which takes place here in Bethany. Uh, because this story, uh, what Mary did, uh, Mary of Bethany has done for Jesus. Uh, this is mentioned in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John 12. So uh, this is something that takes place in Bethany, in Judea. And this Mary is the sister of Lazarus and Martha. And uh, this event takes place at the end of Jesus' ministry. So that is why Jesus says, you know, what she has done, she has done it in uh, honor of my upcoming death and burial. On the other hand, this other event, Luke chapter 7, 36 to 50, that event uh, is somebody else. And over there in that event, it says that that particular woman was a prostitute. So she probably repented of her sins and the Lord showed her mercy rather than condemning her. Uh, you know, he encourages her, forgives her of, of her sins. And out of that gratitude, uh, she comes and she uh, you know, uh, anoints him with the perfume from the alabaster jar. So that event takes place in Galilee. Galilee is a completely separate place. Bethany in Judea is a totally different place. Uh, so these are two separate events. And uh, so it is wrong to say that Mary of Bethany was immoral in any way. Okay. Uh, so uh, that other lady was someone else who was living in Galilee. But this event is uh, dealing with uh, the time just before Jesus' crucifixion, uh, just maybe a few weeks uh, before Jesus' crucifixion. Okay, so um, there's a large crowd which has come for the feast of the Passover, and they have all heard about uh, the miracle that has happened regarding uh, Lazarus. And uh, so it says in uh, verse 9, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus. Um, and then in verse 11, it says, on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. And then it goes on to say the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And then they all you know, wait at the gates of Jerusalem to greet him even as he comes. Um, so uh, maybe we could have someone read out for us uh, verses 13 to 16. Uh, if someone could read out, please, verses 13 to 16. took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. 
Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's horn. Uh, verse 16 as well. Yeah. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they rem remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Yeah. Um, so the wording which they used to greet Jesus, that's basically from uh, Psalm 118. At the time of the Passover, it was customary for uh, the uh, people who have come you know, to the temple to sing uh, Psalms 113 all the way up to Psalm 118. That entire chunk, you know, Psalm 113 up to 118 was called the Hallel, you know, the, 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 the praise. It was called the Hallel, the praise. Uh, and so that was usually sung during the Passover. So these people are actually picking up some wording from Psalm 118 verses 25 to 26. So that's the wording which they choose. Uh, to greet him with. Uh, so if, if you were to look in Psalm 118, 25 to 26, this is the wording over there. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. So uh, they are acknowledging the fact that this Messiah is coming to save them, to grant them success. And so... Uh, they are blessing him in the name of the Lord and they are uh, declaring that from the house of the Lord, we bless you. Okay, so um, when they are crying out uh, Hosanna uh, or rather in Hebrew, that would be Hoshiana. Okay, that basically that wording basically means save us now. Okay, so Hoshiana literally the word Hosanna literally means save us now. And uh, uh, so it was a cry for help. It was also a, a, a proclamation of praise in the sense uh, the people were, would say the word Hosanna uh, as though they, it's not a cry of help, but a cry of victory. In the sense, God will answer the prayer. He will save them. So somewhere uh, down the ages, that word which was supposed to actually be a cry for help turned into a cry of victory. Uh, so even as they say the words, save us now, in fact, they're, they are saying, we are going to be saved now. Okay, So uh, the word Hosanna is actually a cry for help, but it began to be used as a proclamation of victory. So they are crying out this word now, uh, the word Hosanna as a word of praise and, and they are so glad that this person who can raise someone from the dead has come to them as their Messiah and the sad thing is that they're all assuming that he's going to go uh, you know and uh, fight with the Romans and give them political salvation so they're all greeting him with such joy because they think that political liberation is very soon going to come to them uh, they are not so much interested in a uh, spiritual salvation, which is why this entire crowd turns against Jesus, you know, and uh, cries out for his crucifixion later on. Uh, so it's rather sad, um, you know. Um, sometimes it happens even with us who have chosen to become followers of Jesus. We want him to be our savior in a particular way. And when he chooses to be our savior in a different way, you know, there's a chance that we could get bitter. So we need to be careful and guard against that tendency. When he doesn't become our savior in the way we want to be saved, when he doesn't answer our prayers in the way we want them answered, it could lead to anger. It could lead to frustration. And that was the wrong response. He is a savior who really knows how to save. He knows what is best for us. He is the good shepherd. So we need to have an attitude of trust and an attitude of praise and worship, uh, you know, rather than uh, grumble or be bitter or uh, be angry against him. Uh, so like this crowd, 
which is now opening its mouth and praising him and then turns you know into uh, into a into a rebellious crowd that is crying out for his crucifixion we his true followers should not have that attitude um, so however he chooses to save us in the way that he chooses to save us we must be willing to submit and accept his um, dealings with us uh, whatever they may be in complete trust because he is a savior who genuinely can be trusted so over here um, you know if we were to look at the verses you know which came earlier verse 14 it says jesus found a young donkey and sat on it now of course in the other gospels we have details about how exactly that young donkey was found you know jesus tell specifically tells them go to so and such a such Uh, such and such a place, and then you will find the colt tied over there, and that's the colt that I want you to bring. So why was why was so Jesus so particular about uh, you know finding uh, that particular young uh, colt? Uh, the word colt over here basically means a young donkey, um, a donkey that is not yet fully an adult. So which means no one would have actually tamed it yet. No one would have actually. taught it how to carry people uh, you know um, the the untrained animal tends to be a little wild uh, because it's not it used to having people sit on it uh, but here this young colt when jesus sits on it there is no fuss of any kind it just submits to him as though it's one very very experienced you know carrier of uh, people and it just uh, carries him in a noble way uh, so uh, it's i mean we 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 see that detail here uh, jesus could have just chosen a donkey which is used to having people riding on its back but he chooses to uh, use a donkey that has never been ridden upon in a way that's an honor no no one has ever ridden on it but there's also the other aspect that is an untrained colt but still it submits to him it carries him uh, because he is the creator god and the creator king who is riding on it um and um uh, so uh, the reason uh, that jesus chooses the colt is because of zechariah chapter 9 verses 9 to 10 i very difficult to remember what was covered in which class have we talked about uh, why jesus chose a young colt in our um, uh, probably not it's just that very recently i have spoken about this in some class somewhere um uh, so uh, if we were to turn quickly to zechariah 9 9 to 10 um this is the assurance that uh, you know yahweh gives to daughter zion he tells daughter zion uh, maybe we could actually read out that if someone could please read out zechariah 9 9 and 10 zechariah 9 9 and 10 Yeah, if someone could read out Zechariah nine nine and ten. Zechariah chapter nine verse nine and ten. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and of uh, salvation, humble and in and riding on a donkey, upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. I'll cut off the chariot from his eyes. And the house of Jerusalem and the bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. Thank you. Um, and if we could have one of the other students, I uh, know, read so that we will not have the echo echo effect. Because Jeffina is here with me, right? So uh, it kind of creates an echo effect. It's not too much to ask. I mean, I just need you to keep your Bible in front of you and read out a few verses now and then. please if you could just do that and participate in the class um, and yeah those of you who read out regularly thank you so much for that i'm very grateful for that so here we see um, that uh, god assures zion that when the, when her king comes to her he will come on a colt on the foal of a donkey not even a full fledged donkey but a young colt um, uh, rather than on a War horse, 
because you see uh, those who want to bring judgment they ride into the city on war horses and they wreak havoc they bring violence they bring judgment but here zion is being assured and told do worry when your king comes to you he will come to bring peace he will not come to make war against you but rather he will come to declare peace not just to you jerusalem but also to all the nations so here jesus is coming into jerusalem as its savior not as its judge so it's in fact very very significant he does not choose a war horse to ride into that city rather he comes into that city on a colt on a young foal to assure jerusalem and the nations that he is not coming as a judge but rather as savior and he is also coming with righteousness and victory you see that's what it says in verse 9 it says see your king comes to you righteous and victorious lowly you know humble and riding on a donkey uh, so uh, these are the virtues characteristics with which jesus makes his entry um, and um, then it goes on to say in verse 17 uh, now the crowd that was with him when he called lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word and then in verse 18 we are told many people because they had heard that he had performed this sign went out to meet him and the pharisees are very upset they say the whole world is gone after him and they are very very upset about this and then uh, if someone could read out for us verses 20 to 23 uh, john 12 20 to 23 Mm, on the screen, I have someone named Anita. Anita, could you please uh, re- uh, read out for us uh, John chapter twelve, uh, verses twenty to twenty-three? Go ahead. Okay, maybe Anita is not logged in. Uh, so, anyone on the screen, you know, who can read out for us John chapter twelve, verses twenty to twenty-three. Now there was a uh, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast then they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and asked him saying sir we wish to see Jesus Philip came and told Andrew and he turned Andrew and Philip told Jesus uh to Nitri also yes but this uh answered them saying the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified all right so here it says that some greeks wanted to meet jesus uh and um uh, uh it looks like these greeks are from um bethsaida because it's you know they say they came, they came to philip who was from bethsaida in galilee uh so uh, bethsaida was a trading town uh, so you would have a lot of foreigners coming over there for you know uh, mercantile purposes uh, so we have these people coming to philip because they you know they probably are familiar with the fact that philip is a disciple of jesus so they come and they request and they say we would like to meet with jesus and then when jesus gets to know about this he speaks out and he says the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified why why does he say now the son, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified if you remember up to now you know we have uh, many places where john the writer writes and says the hour had not yet come and so you know, on on different occasions you know when you, when uh, the people are trying to attack jesus it says his hour had not yet come and so he was able to uh, leave that place and go away uh, so but now jesus finally says the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified the reason that he says that is that all the things which are which are supposed to lead up to the crucifixion are now being fulfilled you see uh, we read in uh, uh, the earlier verse uh, that many of them have are now beginning to believe in him that was in verse 11 uh, 
but on account of Lazarus, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. And then it, it, it says here in 18, many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And now you even have foreigners coming. You know, now there, are, there were some Greeks, it says in verse 20, and they too wanted to meet him. So all the true sheep who are willing to hear his voice are now being gathered into the fold. The sheep are all getting ready to meet their shepherd. So now it is time for the shepherd to lay down his life for them. So the hour has now indeed come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Uh, and uh, so the interesting thing is that he's glorifying himself uh, not by establishing himself on a throne. He is glorifying himself by dying for the people, for his sheep. Uh, so uh, if we could, you know, uh, dwell on those verses, um, if we could have someone read out verses 23 to 26. Uh, yeah, if someone could read out for us. Um, John 12, verses 23 to 26, please. Jesus but Jesus them, answered them saying, yeah. but Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Amen. Yeah. Um, so in verse 23, we see that the Son of Man is going to be glorifying himself. And how is he going to be glorifying himself? Uh, he says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And so this son of man is going to glorify himself by dying so that through him, many seeds will be brought alive. You know, many uh, lives will be saved. And he says, his followers also should be following the same principle. So he goes on to say in verse 25, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. There's a contrast being made over here between eternal life and life in this world. So we should regard life in this world as something very temporary. Here the word hate is not really talking about hatred. You know, it's to, uh, it's uh, here the word hate is being used in the New Testament sense, you know, uh, in, in various places in the New uh, Testament, you know, Jesus uh, talks about how we should hate something versus, uh, you know, loving something else. In the sense, he says, unless a person uh, hates their father and mother, you know, uh, he is not my disciple. Over there, it's not talking about us actually hating father and mother, it's talking about priorities. It was a metaphor that was very familiar to the Hebrew people. It was a Hebrew metaphor where to express your priorities, you would say, I hate this when compared to that, because that is more valuable, that is more precious. You are not, you know, it doesn't mean that you actually hate uh, the other item that is being mentioned. It is a Hebrew metaphor. That is uh, that simply indicates that you're prioritiz prior prioritizing something so high that in comparison with that thing which you value so much, everything else that you love is almost like just mere hate. You know, so uh, it is it is valuing something that much. So here Jesus is saying, you must hate this temporary life which you have on the earth. Um, to an extent uh, where, uh, you know, your love for eternal life is shown. So your love for eternal life should be so great that in comparison to that, the love that you have for the life over here, it almost looks like mere hatred. Uh, 
so he says if a person is willing to lay down their life in that manner it goes on to say in verse 26 my father will honor the one who serves me in that manner so the son of man glorifies himself by dying by serving in the same way his followers are also being urged to be willing to die and sacrifice uh, you know themselves to the things of this world so that they may be honored by the father so glorification honor comes through death comes through sacrifice comes through giving up something and we give up these things for our lord and savior he in turn gives a, gave gave up himself on our behalf uh, so um, glorification comes through death through sacrifice uh, that's the point which jesus brings out over here um the next few verses are very interesting uh, if we can have someone read out for us uh, verses 27 to 30 and uh, thank you so much you know for being so willing to read out uh, so yeah verses 27 to 30 if someone could read out Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood, stood by and heard it said that it had hundred thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. 30. Uh, Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Okay, this is an audible voice from heaven. And this is the third time this takes place. The first time that an audible voice was heard was during his baptism, uh, when you know the father says that this is my son and I'm well pleased with him. The second um, uh, time that an audible voice from heaven is heard is during the transfiguration on the mount. You know, when the um, disciples who have been taken up on the mount along with him, they hear God's voice uh, acknowledging uh, that that this Jesus should be obeyed you know, and that he should be worshipped. So now for the third time, we have the voice from heaven and the people who are hearing, uh, to, to some of them it sounds like a loud thunder, but then the others are able to understand that actual words have been spoken. And they assume that some angel has spoken. And then Jesus says, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Because all along Jesus had been saying, I have another person also giving testimony for me. And the testimony is from the father. And so literally you have the father testifying and saying, yes, I have glorified my, uh, you know, uh, my name. And now I will glorify it again through you. So you know that, that's confirmation. It's testimony from the father that this Jesus is from him. Uh, so we have that testimony being given. And then from there, um, maybe we could uh, move into verses. Yeah, these are important verses. Uh, so if we can have someone read out for us, uh, verses 31 to 33. Yeah, if, if we could have someone read out, uh, verses 31, 32, 33. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This is said, signifying by what death he would die. Yeah, if you could also just read for us verses 34 and 35 as well. Yes, 34 and 35 as well, please. The people answered him, We have heard from the Lord that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then yeah. Jesus said to them, A little while longer the yeah. man. Okay. 
so sorry i didn't mean to interrupt go ahead a little while longer the light is with you walk while you have the light least darkness overtake you he who walks in darkness does not know where he is going yeah uh, so here um the people understand what jesus is saying when he says uh, and when i am lifted up from the earth i will draw all people to myself all right so they understand that he's talking about death okay and that's why verse 33 confirms he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die and the people understand that he is referring to death about being lifted up from the earth and so then they say we have been told in the old testament that the messiah will remain forever so and you are talking about dying so you know what is this i mean how can the son of man uh, Uh, die are you a different kind of a son of man are you not the messiah who you know who's being talked about in daniel 7 that's the question which they ask because they are unable to understand how uh, uh, this messiah could die because they expect the messiah to live forever so if you look at these verses it looks like as if this messiah is headed towards defeat he is headed towards uh you know death and loss in the eyes of the world what he is about to do does not make any sense um he says over here now is the time for judgment on this world now the prince of this world will be driven out but he talks about him dying so it appears as the, the judgment is going to come upon him it appears as though he is the one who's going to be driven out so you see when you look at this uh, of uh, this act of jesus uh, from a human perspective it looks like defeat and what looks like defeat is in fact a great act of triumph and victory so so which is why you know in uh, the in the epistles uh, paul talks about how what looked like foolishness to the world was in fact divine wisdom uh what even the principalities and powers could not understand god uses that method to bring about a triumphant and great victory so here even though it appears as though when jesus was hanging on the cross judgment came upon him and he is the one who was driven out the truth is that it was actually the prince of this world who was driven out it was the, uh, the judgment came upon the prince of the world and the you know his followers rather than upon jesus uh, and uh, so this is what jesus says he says you're going to have the light just a little while longer you know so while the light is there believe in what i am saying while i'm still here believe in what i am saying um and um uh, then in verse 36 jesus says believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light when he had finished speaking jesus left and hid himself from them and in verse 37 it goes on to say even after jesus had performed so many signs in their presence they still would not believe in him so there were people who having seen all the miracles that he performed they still would not believe in him in their eyes what jesus was saying sounded foolish they could not understand how death can lead to triumph so they were looking at things through a worldly perspective they were not true sheep because the true sheep would be able to hear his voice and they would be able to catch in their spirit that he is the true living messiah even though they may not understand the actual words and what exactly he is saying in their spirit because they are the true sheep they would sense that what is being told is the truth but these people you know uh, who have not believed in him they are obviously not the true sheep and that is why it says when he had finished speaking jesus left and hid himself from them he did not feel it necessary to pursue them any longer why because the words of isaiah are being fulfilled over here and that is why he says it it, it says in john uh, 
12 verse 38 lord who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed so this is something that isaiah had prophesied that there are some people to whom even when the arm of the lord is revealed they will choose not to believe and that prophecy is now being fulfilled over here All right so we will continue to look at this after the break uh, so we'll rejoin once again at uh, 10 o'clock thank you